Thank you very much. So for the last several weeks, we've been hearing about putting on the armor of God. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But before I do, or as I do, I want to show you a few pictures to help our understanding. Here's the first one. So they, have, they are a cohort of Roman soldiers with their shields. What I want you to notice there is that they are together. They are standing together. Now... We know that in this series, we've each individually been encouraged to put on the full armor of God. But there's another aspect as well, and that's the aspect of standing together. Here's another one. Of the troop of soldiers are all standing together. Unity is very important. Standing together as one is very important. I'm going to ask you a question. Who are you standing next to? Who is the one, as these soldiers are standing next to each other, so that the enemy can't find even a paper-thin area where, they, where he can get in. Who are you standing next to in the struggle that we have against the powers of darkness? The Roman army at the time of the apostle, Paul, when he wrote the letter, was the most powerful army in the world. It was a fearsome sight. It was well-trained. It was self-disciplined. It was confident. There was a working together. Now, just to bring it up to date... To show that we still use the same kind of technique in the modern times as the riot police come out with their shields, which they've learned from the times of the Romans. The point is this, they stand together. This is very important. The unity of the church is crucial. And one of the things that the devil would love to do is destroy the unity of the church. How good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity, the psalmist tells us. So these things are very important. Who are you standing next to? Who are you in unity with? How are you maintaining the unity of the body of Christ? These things are all important. And now for the sword. This is the type of sword a Roman soldier would carry. It's called a gladius. It was about this long. It had a sharp point, as you can see, and was double-edged. It was a fearsome weapon. It could be used to stab and slash. Of course, the Apostle Paul is using the idea of the sword as a metaphor. In other words, it's a picture that represents something else. And here is a soldier dressed ready for battle. And in those days, they conquered the known world. The Apostle Paul tells us in verse 17 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. Now, unlike other parts of the armor that we've been looking at over the last several weeks, which are for defense, the sword is for both offense and defense, to attack and defend. Now, the first thing I want to say is this. The word of God is powerful. And we know from experience that human words can have power. It's not surprising Because we're made in God's image. And so human words can also have power. I can remember 50 years ago. No, sorry. 60 years ago even. My father, who left school when he was 14. So he wasn't particularly well educated, as some of you are here. um, And he wasn't very good with words in one sense. But I do remember when I was a little boy, him saying one word to me. I can remember it today, 60 odd years later. And that word that he spoke to me, just one word, had power because it was a word of affirmation. It was a word of encouragement. It was a word that strengthened me. And even now, all that time later, I can still remember what he said to me. On a much bigger scale, in living memory, we've seen wars started with words the inflammatory words that Hitler spoke. We've seen genocide created with human words. We've also had words that aim to produce a different kind of future. Here's something I read. We must therefore act together as a united people for national reconciliation. Who do you think said that? You can call out. We must therefore act together as a united people for national reconciliation. 
reconciliation. Anybody at home know that? Anybody here? Have a guess. Come on. Don't be shy. Huh? Nelson Mandela. Yeah, Nelson Mandela said that. Reconciliation. So his words helped shape that nation. Instead of having a civil war, which could easily have happened, he spoke words of reconciliation that were powerful. But the thing is this. God's word is the most powerful of all. We see it in Genesis 1-3, for example. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke the cosmos into being. And faith also comes, we're told in the book of Hebrews, through hearing God's word. And Jesus also said, Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now that is power. So what I'm saying is that the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is a powerful weapon in our struggle against the powers of darkness. God's word is powerful in reaching the lost, in advancing the kingdom of God. And we should not be afraid to use the word of God in the ministries that we have in the church. I can remember again when I was younger, 20 years old, it was the fact that the word of God was spoken to me. It wasn't a great lengthy thing either. It wasn't a sermon. It was something that Jesus said when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That was the word of God, and it cut me right to the heart. But not in a bad way. It cut me right to the heart in a very good way because I could experience the same time the truth of who Jesus is and know the love of God. So in our evangelistic outreach, in our king's table, in our Christians Against Poverty, in our Little Stars ministry, in our teaching English, we should never be afraid to use the Word of God. Because the Word of God is transformative. The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God gets right to the heart of the matter. Your Word is a lamp for my feet, the psalmist says, 119, 105. A light on my path. And we all need that in the darkness of this world. You know, I've heard some people saying this. I never watch the news. And I get that. I never, I never, I'm not, I don't know. And the reason is this, because it's so depressing. You know, whenever you turn the six o'clock news on and whenever it is, 10 o'clock, it's depressing. It's a war here, fighting there, strike here, earthquake there. It's all very de- depressing. We need light in the darkness. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So we need to get into the word of God. And Jesus used the word of God to repel the devil. Jesus, as we know, he was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. And as he was baptized, the spirit of God came down upon him in the form of a dove. And God the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness And at that time, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, I fasted a few times. I'll tell you what, three days, wow, that's tough. Three days, five days, that's asking a bit too much. I might just, just cope with it. 40 days and 40 nights. And Jesus fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And at this time, he's vulnerable. Just picture this. And so what happens? The devil comes along at Jesus' vulnerable moment in life. And he tempts him three times. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus, what does he do? This is what he does. He gets out the sword. And he says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. But the devil, being very crafty, decides that he too can quote from the word of God. And as he takes Jesus to the high point of the temple, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, having a much better understanding, of course, of God's word than the devil, Jesus gets the sword out again. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil, of course, he does not give up easily. 
he comes to Jesus a third time. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus gets out the sword for the third time. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Take that. And the devil is repelled. And Jesus does it by using the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Jesus had the Word of God at his fingertips. There was another occasion when a group of religious leaders came to Jesus, the Sadducees, and they did not believe in the resurrection. And they thought they would trip Jesus up. And they came and they said, well, there was a woman. She was married. There were seven brothers. She met with her first husband died, then she married the next brother. He died, then the next. He died, then the next. Then the next, then the next. So who will she be married to at the resurrection, which they did not believe in? Jesus said to them, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. You do not know the scriptures. And my question to all of us this morning is this. Do we know the scriptures? Do you know the scriptures? Do you? Do you know them? I'm not just talking about being able to quote them. That is helpful. Or even memorize them. That is helpful. But I'm talking about knowing them in such a way that they impact your life in a positive way. Do you know the scriptures? In that way. Do you know the scriptures in a way that positively impacts your life? Because if you don't, you don't know them. You might be able to quote them. You might have memorized them. But if they're not affecting your life in a positive manner, you don't know them. Really. You don't know that sense of they've been illuminated to you by the Holy Spirit and affected your life. Because uh, knowing the word of God... It's a knowledge that produces wisdom on how to live and insight, and it develops good character. That's the kind of knowing that we're talking about. So what I want to say as well is this. Never dismiss yourself on the grounds that I'm not clever, like some people. I, I, I don't like study. I never have done. From the time I was at school, I always felt, you know, as if I was not as good as other people. Um, That's not my thing. I don't want you to dismiss yourself because of that. Neither, I I can't remember great chunks of stuff. I'm not very good at that, unlike some people. Or I'm dyslexic. You know, reading's not my thing. Please don't dismiss yourself. Because if it depended on being very clever, then I would fail for a start. And not everyone wants to get the study guide out or the commentary and work out the significance of the Old Testament high priest's breastplate or the historical background of the book of Obadiah. Often that job can be for teachers of the church. I'm talking about the words of God that are deposited in your heart by the Spirit of God. That's what I'm talking about. That's the knowledge that I'm talking about. When the Word of God is deposited in your heart and mind by the Spirit of God in such a way that you can draw upon it in the struggle. You can draw upon it in the battle. You can gain victory over the powers of darkness. That's the kind of knowledge I'm talking about. And I want to say this. It's open to any Christian of any background, of any degree of education or lack of it. Anyone. So you cannot, dear friends, dismiss yourself on the grounds that I'm dyslexic, I don't like reading, I can't study. No. If that was the criteria, then most of us would fail. It's about the Spirit of God working on the Word of God and depositing it in our heart. Now, teachers of the Word are very helpful, and God has provided them to find out the background of Obadiah, what that was all about, and explain it to us. And thank the Lord for the teachers that we have in the church. But having said all that, we need to read the Bible for ourselves. Now, in the English-speaking world, we are the most blessed of all people on the face of the earth in terms of having availability for the Word of God. Many nations have only got portions of the Word of God. Some haven't got any. We have got an overflowing abundance 
We've got the authorized version. We've got the revised standard version. We've got the new international version. We've got the contemporary English version. We've got the good news version. We've got the living Bible. We've got the message, and I could go on. All in English. Not only that, we've got on the internet apps and what have you, an abundance. One of the things that we do at King's is uh, is a kind of introduction to Christian living. We do something called chapter one. We also do chapter two. And one of the things that we help uh, promote on chapter one is what's called rhythm of scripture. In other words, getting into reading the Bible. And at the moment, there's an app that many people have joined that we're using, and it's going through the New Testament in a year. And there are Spaces for 150 people to sign up. I looked the other day, 120, praise the Lord, had signed up. So that means there's room for another 30. It's something that you might like to consider. If you, if you do, kchw.co.uk forward slash Bible will explain it all to you. And I looked at the app again the other day because I'm going through the New Testament with others. And you can comment on it. And you can even do the audio bit. You don't even have to read it. You can just press play and it will read it out for you. Uh, I saw on the other day there's one on the Psalms. There was one on hope. Little short you know, daily things. And another one on Easter. There was an eight-day thing on Easter that's coming up. So all helpful, useful things in order to encourage us and help us to get into the Word of God. I've got the audio Bible as well. It can be listened to in a variety of languages. We're so blessed with what we have. We can also study. We can look into things. We can see how it applies to us today. We can do that if we're interested in doing that. Or we can join a group that does Bible study. There are several groups in the church that you could join if you wanted to get into some part of the Bible. Ever so helpful. I can remember even, or it must be... At least 40 years ago, when Joy, my wife, and I, we were part of a group that was doing a Bible study. They were doing a study on Nehemiah. 40 odd years ago. I still can remember things that have impacted me. So here are two of them. One of them was um, the fact that in the book of Nehemiah, they're rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem because it had been destroyed. And in one part of Nehemiah, it talks about someone who was repairing the wall opposite their house. In other words, it was something accessible for them. It wasn't too hard. All they had to do was just walk across, and there was the wall, and they could build it. They didn't have to go to the ends of the earth to do it. And that spoke to me about what could I do with what I've got that might not be too hard, but I could do it in order to help further the church's work or the kingdom or something like that. And then another thing that spoke to me was that someone repaired the dung gate. The dung gate. And I thought, If they repair the dung gate, uh, would I be prepared? Would I have been prepared to do something like that? Not the best job in the world, in other words. You know, something that maybe most people wouldn't want to do repair the dung gate. Can you imagine the stench that there might be there? And we've got people in this church working on the equivalent of our own dung gate. They're unheard, you don't see them. They're working behind the background, they're doing things maybe that other people wouldn't want to do, but Jesus sees. Jesus. The point is this. I was part of a little study group many, many years ago, and I've been another since then, where things that spoke to me even then are still with me. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we can study and look into things. Another thing we can do is we can ponder things that we have read or heard. Ponder things. Maybe, it may be that in the night you wake up. It may be that in the night as you wake up, a little scripture pops into your mind. Or maybe just a phrase from the Bible, from the Word of God. It may be that you're driving your car. It may be that you're doing the dishes. It may be that you're cooking. It may be that you're walking to work. And something just pops into your mind, out of the blue, as it were. And it's the Word of God. It's the Spirit of God bringing something to your attention. At that time, you can ponder. You can ponder that. What are you saying to me at this particular time? Why has that popped into my mind? Or even, you could bring something to mind yourself, our Father. Two words. Our Father. Hmm. Ponder. 
What does that mean? What's the significance of who is in heaven? Hmm. Hallowed be your name. Ponder, think about it. Yeah, your name should be hallowed, but it should be honored. Am I doing it? Am I honoring you? Am I honoring you by the way I speak? Am I honoring you by the way I think? Am I honoring you by the things I do? Hallowed be your name. And your kingdom come. Yeah, it'd be great to see that, Lord. Yeah, I can't wait. Can I be involved in that? How can I be involved in that? Your kingdom come. Yes. We need that. We need to see that, Lord. We need to see the darkness dispelled. We need to see the kingdom triumph. Can I be involved in that? You ponder the word of God. That's another thing that you can do. The word of the Spirit brings that to your memory. Also, the word of God in song. I love it when we sing the truths of the scriptures in song. And we've done some of that this morning. I love it because it renews my sense of confidence in the Lord. Let me give you some examples. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. Sing along with me. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. You know, it's just fantastic, isn't it? It lifts your spirit. And I have noticed down through the years that where I've been coming to Kings, that when we sing things that elevate Christ, when we sing things which are theologically meaty and true, there's a great surge of worship comes in the congregation. Here's another example. He wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. Oh, I just love that. The darkness trembles at his voice. What does that tell me about God? It tells me that he is almighty. It tells me that he is undefeated. It tells me he can never be defeated. Oh, and he's on my side. Hallelujah. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Son. The Lion and the Lamb. The Lion and the Lamb. Jesus is a Lion of the tribe of Judah who is conquered. He roars. And the whole creation trembles. But he's the Lamb of God as well, who gives his life, who sacrifices his life. How can these things be the lion and the lamb? I could sing that song a thousand times and I would never get tired of it because there's such a deep well of truth in it. That's another way in which we can get this, the, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Christ alone, cornerstone, Weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord. Lord of all. It renews my confidence. It means the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, comes to me afresh and I gain confidence. And I think, yeah, Jesus is great. God is great. He loves me. So the Word of God in song is also very important. Now let's look a bit more at using the sword. I want to give some examples quickly from my own Life. These are not simply favorite scriptures. It's deeper than that. But ones I believe that the Lord has embedded in my heart. And I can draw out the sword. And I often do. I've shared some of these publicly before. And I make no apology for doing it again. Because I want to get the sword out. And show you. James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly light who does not change like shifting shadows. That tells me my God does not change. He loved me yesterday. He loves me today. He will love me tomorrow. And he's the father of the heavenly lights. Oh, what a sublime, spirit-inspired description of God who loves us. The father of the heavenly lights. And he gives good gifts. Oh, good and perfect gifts. That's who he is. And it renews my confidence. It renews my strength as I ponder that word. And I draw the sword when the devil tells me that God is not on my side. And I use the sword. I say, get that. Be gone. Psalm 27 verse 13. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, David, who wrote the psalm, talks about that. At a time of warfare, if war rages against me, or, you know, I get besieged by my enemies. He says, I will remain confident of this. 
See, the devil comes. He wants to undermine your confidence. He wants to undermine your faith because we are in a struggle, dear friends. We are in a battle and we have to draw the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the devil comes and he says to us, if God was good, then how come this is happening to you? If God is good, then why are your key prayers not being answered? If God is good and you fasted, didn't you? more than once, and you haven't seen what you want. In fact, the opposite has happened. If God is good, why then is this happening to you? I remain confident of this. I take the sword of the Spirit out, and I say, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Where? Not just when I die, but in the land of the living. Take that! Third one I want to give you is from Psalm 139, verse 13. And the whole psalm is fantastic. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When I feel that my life has been devalued by things people say to me or by simply feeling low down and depressed, this tells me that I don't exist by chance but by divine purpose. You are the one who created my inmost being and you did it before the foundation of the world because you have got a purpose for my life. You think and you make my life significant, Lord, regardless of what others may say to me, regardless of what's happened to me in my life where people have let me down, disappointed me, betrayed me. Nevertheless, you are the one who created me. You knitted me together, my mother's womb. I'm precious to you before my thoughts come. You know them all together. That's who you are. Thank you, Jesus. I draw out the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and I say, take that. Do you? Do you? Do you take out the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and do you stand? Do you stand in the face of Despair. Do you stand in the face of feeling depressed? Do you stand in the face of lies? Do you stand against the experiences, the negative experiences that you have had in your life? Do you take out the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and say, take that? Because that is what this is about. Dear friends, get into God's Word, however you can, but don't put it off until tomorrow. The Word of God is powerful and it's effective. The Word of God, keep it in your heart and mind and let it shape you. And I know for a fact that many of you here have got the Word of God in your heart and your mind. Don't simply say, oh, these are my favorite verses. No, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's things that the Spirit of God has embedded in your heart for the battle. So do not be afraid to take out that sword, dear friends. Even if you do it every day, do not be afraid to speak it out. Don't be afraid to share it with others. Don't be afraid to testify. Because when you do, you're taking out this sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you say, take that. Let's not be afraid to use the Word of God in our evangelistic outreach. As it can tear down the devil's strongholds and bring light into the darkness of people's lives. Amen? Amen. Amen.